Okay, uh, welcome back to our um, second lecture on BC 106. So there was a question in the class about the exam for this course. So for this course, we'll just have one exam at the very end, uh, which will be uh, cumulative, will be A to Z, start to finish, cover all the content. Uh, it'll be multiple choice questions. Uh, so those of you who are studying online in class or online, you will do your exam in Google Classroom. Uh, those who are studying on the e-learning, you will do your exam in the e-learning. It'll be the same questions, both places. Now don't go copy from here to there. <laughs> Whichever place you're doing your exam, you do the exam only once, okay? Just either on Google Classroom or for those of uh, who you who are doing it on, on e-learning, you do your exam only on e-learning. It'll be the same set of questions, same grade, everything, same. One final exam, 100 marks, covers everything. And it will be open book, open Bible exam. So you don't have to memorize anything. You just uh, keep your notes open in front of you, keep your Bible open in front of you, and answer the questions. Only condition is no discussion. Do it independently by yourself. OK? Any questions? What was your question? Answered. Your question, Sean? Oh, so the second year starts in August. Yeah, so we have, um, so your exams will happen last week of April. Last week of April is exam. Uh, and so everything is automatically graded. So you'll get your grade as soon as you click submit, you get your grade. So. Um, yeah, exams happen last week of August, sorry, April. And then May, June, July, May, June, July, three months. Uh, there's not, I mean, there's, there's no semester, but what we actually run is we run a short-term Bible course. Um, that is for those students who just want to do a few courses who come here or online. So we we run a short two months short Bible course. Uh, it's like a mini version of just a certain number of topics, not the whole three years. So that happens during uh, May fifteenth to July fifteenth, two months, and then the actual Bible college classes will resume from August first. Chirag. Um, I was thinking of doing, I mean, we haven't, so far we haven't done it online, but I was thinking of putting it online so that those who cannot come here, so usually we used to have it in North India, so we used to run these courses in Varanasi. This is the first time we're going to do it in Bangalore, here, uh, two months, and uh, I was thinking of putting it online also so that those who cannot come here can do it. Uh, the only thing is, uh, I'm, not, I'm not decided whether we should give them a certificate or not, because there's no way to verify they've actually uh, attended all the classes and so on. We'll see. I'm just thinking about it. But initially, uh, we've never done it online, the short term Bible college. We'll announce it. Okay, getting back to our class. Okay, <laughs> let's go now to, we'll continue where we paused. So we we just introduced the this aspect of types and shadows. Now I want us to think about these three uh, different uh, ways of look, looking at scripture. One is type. Now another one is illustration, and uh, third one is allegorizing. And we need to understand the difference. The most important thing is, uh, the major difference is that the, uh, the type, the type and the, the anti-type, the fulfillment, uh, it's clearly given in scripture. 
Okay, so there is a type, there is an anti type. That means some, like example, the shadow, you see the, the shadow of the tree, you come in the New Testament, you see the tree. Okay, the actual. And it, very important for the type is it is designed, is designed by God. Point number five. And the illustration is a comparison. It is, again, you also see it in scripture uh, as an illustration, right? It's given. So type, so most important thing, when we're talking about type and illustration, now we're talking from, from a scriptural point of view. The type and the illustration are both found in the Bible. Okay, that means the Bible itself is saying, you know, this is a type, I may not use the word type, but it's pointing to something in the Old Testament and says that was speaking about this. So the Bible itself draws that connection. Okay, so very important. Type and illustration, what we are talking about, it must be found in the Bible. The Bible must draw that connection. Okay. The Bible is telling us there is a direct connection. The difference between the type and the illustration is one is the illustration is only is communicating. Uh, it's like a, a figure, a, a message. It's communicating a message. Example. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so the Son of Man will be dead for, for three days. So this is an illustration. Neither Jonah nor the whale is pointing to Jesus. Okay? Jonah is not pointing to Jesus. Whale also definitely not pointing. But this is an illustration. As Jonah was in the belly of the fish, I'm saying whales, I shouldn't say whale, fish. Right? Is the illustration. It's illustrating something. It's illustrating that Jesus would be dead, but it, and then he would rise up. It's illustrating the death, but he'll end, resurrects. But this is not a type. There is not a direct comparison. Whereas when we said, we mentioned Melchizedek earlier. Melchizedek is a direct comparison to Jesus Christ. What aspect of Melchizedek compares him to Christ? One, two things. One is he was a high priest. Jesus is our great high priest. Second, there is no record of his ancestry, his past, or his future. So the writer of Hebrews is using that to say Christ was eternal. No, eternally, we know, I mean, past, eternal, future, eternal. Now, the point is Melchizedek was a man. We know he was born and we know he died. But because the scripture doesn't give us anything about his past or anything about his future, he just appears. So the writer of Hebrews is using that to say, like that Christ is eternal. All right? So two points of comparison, the priesthood and past, present, future, eternal. Now this is a direct comparison. That is a type pointing to the anti-type or the fulfillment, which is Jesus Christ. Whereas Jonah in the belly of the fish is a illustration. You're getting it? It's the difference between. But both are pointed to us in Scripture. Nobody may, I'm not making it up. It is point, It is stated in Scripture that you can use it like this. Or example, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Right? So the Bible itself is saying, 
like that, that it'll be like this, as in the days of Noah. illustration. Doesn't mean Noah is pointing to Jesus, no. But it's as it was in those days, it will be before Jesus comes. Illustration. You're getting the difference. A type means there is a direct comparison, connection between something or someone in the Old Testament with something or someone in the New Testament. Direct connection. Illustration means there is some message being given from something in the Old Testament. But both these are actually stated in Scripture. That's how we can use it. Got it? Allegory is something I make up. If I make up something and it is not stated in Scripture, then I am allegorizing. That means I am assigning a meaning to the Bible, to anything in the Bible, which God never intended. And that is, that is something we should not do. Like I said, an example. David represents the church. Goliath represents Satan. So the church must go and defeat Satan. Is that stated in scripture? Anywhere? I'm not sure. It's not stated. So if somebody is uh, preaching that message, they're allegorizing. That means they're assigning a meaning to something in the Bible which God never intended, the Holy Spirit never intended. And that is a wrong thing to do. So I'm just highlighting saying don't do it. Don't do it. Okay. Questions, Sean? So suppose I say that uh, David is like us as believers, no matter how big an obstacle is like Goliath, we should have faith that God will get us through it. Is that allegorizing? If we say David is like a like representing believer, that will be allegorizing. Right? What we should say is, so if I want to use the story of David and Goliath, I should say, just as David was so courageous to find Goliath, he had faith in God. We must do like that. That is not allegorizing. That is, I am drawing a lesson from Old Testament scripture. I'm drawing a meaning. That is perfectly fine. Because the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 15 and also in 1 Corinthians 10, that the things that have been written in the Old Testament have been written for our learning and for our edification. So if I say, so, you know, look at David, how he went and fought Goliath and how he had faith in God and he depended on the covenant that he had with God. So we also must be like that. We must, you know, have faith in God. We must uh, depend on our covenant with God. We must face whatever giants we are facing in life. So that is not an allegorizing. That is, I am drawing lesson. I'm drawing spiritual truths from something in the Bible and I'm applying it to my life. That is good. But the moment I say David represents the believer or David represents Christ or David represents the church and Goliath represents the devil, that is allegorizing. That means I am assigning to this character, David, or to Goliath, something that the Bible is not assigning. I'm just using David and Goliath, but that people do it for so many other things. And we shouldn't do it, right? So let's look at this. So, so you understood, you understood type, illustration, allegorizing. You understood it. We go to the details. So the type and the anti-type. So in a type, the type and the anti-type have natural correspondence res resemblance. Melchizedek, Jesus, one to one. Priest, priest. No beginning, no ending. No beginning, no ending. There is a correspondence. Sean. I'm sorry. Uh, Melchizedek was also a king, king of Salem. Yeah. So you could use that also. Right. You could use that also. Right. But the writer of Hebrews was highlighting his priesthood. He's talking about he's comparing the priesthood. So stay with that. But king is fine. Yeah. But king is not highlighted in Hebrews. So I would we don't don't highlight that. But Hebrews is highlighting his priesthood. Okay, he's a priest forever, as Melchizedek. So you highlight that. That aspect. Oh my! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I forgot to plug it. Illustration. 
example, we mentioned some. Uh, there is truth. There is correspondence. There is resemblance. Example, Noah in the belly of the fish. Or, or uh, what do we say? Um, as in the days of Noah, so will be the son of man. So there's some illustration. It's illustrating, it's conveying a truth. In allegorizing, what's happening is there is no natural correspondence, but a forced or hidden meaning is given to the text. That means I am putting some meaning into the text. Okay. Number two, the type has historical real reality. Yeah, there was Melchizedek, you know, that actually happened. The illustration truth relationship depends on the historical reality of the illustration. That means, again, in illustration that actually happens, it was there. In allegorizing, the literal meaning is left out. They're not looking at the literal meaning. It's uh, it's disregarded. Allegorizing, yeah. Okay, so Prince' question is, um, how do I put it? So you're saying, oh, we we get some meaning out of a passage, but it's not what the actual passage is saying. Is that yeah? The revelation. So now uh, I will mention. Yeah, I mentioned this a little later. Uh, in the bottom of this page, uh, sorry, not here. Uh, there's one more, one lesson that we do. I think it's lesson number ten on avoiding allegorizing. So we'll explain that there. But and over there, I I did put a note on prophetic inspiration, where in the case of a, giving a prophetic message, for example. Um, Suppose I'm ministering prophetically to somebody, and at that moment, the Lord reminds me like about Joseph and says, Hey, this man is going through what Joseph went through. Uh, he's been falsely accused. So then I might, in that prophetic message, I might I might say, just like how Joseph was falsely accused, you are you are being falsely accused. Right? So I'm drawing a point of comparison between a Bible character and this person. So in that sense, I am allegorizing because I'm assigning a meaning which was not assigned in scripture. But I'm doing it in order to bring a prophetic message. So that is okay. But that is very specific to that individual. I'm not preaching and teaching the word of God. Right? So in the preaching and teaching the word of God, we must not allegorize. Because then we anybody will bring any meaning. Uh, they will say anything out of the Bible. So in the preaching and teaching the word of God, don't allegorize. But if I'm giving a message to personal pro prophecy or a message like that, that's okay. The Lord is telling me something about his life by using something in the scriptures. So that's okay. Right? So in chapter 10, we'll explain that. That's okay. That happens often. Um, okay. Going back to your actual question, if somebody claims a revelation, uh, and actually, this, uh, the fact is, in the church, you hear a lot of messages that are actually allegories. Uh, people are assigning meaning to things that are actually not in the Bible. Right? And lots of sermons are being preached. Technically, it's wrong. It's wrong to do that. But nobody, at least for the most part, Nobody allegorizes and said, tells some people go and do something wrong. Right? They don't allegorize a text and tell people to commit sin. Generally, they don't do that. So that's why it kind of people still accept it, but technically it's it's not the right way to handle God's words. You know, but then there are a lot of people who preach those kinds of sermons. It's fine, people just take it, nobody questions. 
because nobody's thinking, hey, actually what he's doing is wrong in handling the word of God. But he's not, he doesn't tell anybody to go and commit sin, so nobody questions. You know. But if, for example, uh, and I have preached sermons which are allegories, but then I tell people, this is not the actual meaning of the text. I'm just doing this to illustrate something to you. I'll tell them. For example, one, me one message that I commonly preach is about um, the Mary miracle. So there are about seven or eight points uh, from, and it's in the in print, it's in a couple of books as well, uh, where we look at how Mary gave birth to Jesus, and then we bring out eight points from there. Now, that is not in scripture. That is not the correct way to in interpret the birth of Jesus. But I received it by inspiration in a moment. That means, I remember this was way back, I think, um, in uh, 2001, December 2001. Uh, I had to preach a Christmas message. I didn't have a message. Uh, I was standing there in front. The church was small. We had only about, I don't know, 20 people in the church. I didn't have a Christmas message. And then I was standing in front. By the time the worship was over, by the time I could go from there to here, the whole message came into my spirit. Then I preached it. And then after that, I went and wrote the notes. You know, and then it's in print. But it was not, if I look at it technically, it's, it's not the right way to handle the word of God, meaning it's allegorizing. I was taking uh, how Jesus was born and saying, this is what we must do. But it is okay because the eight points that I mentioned are not telling people to go and do something wrong. Like, I'm just saying, okay, this is how God births his work through us, giving birth to the works of God. Uh, but it's an allegory, allegorizing. And we shouldn't do, I, 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 other than that, I try to avoid doing it because it's not handling God's word correctly. Uh, so suppose when you're giving a message and during that time, you feel like God reveals to you that you should like use this example from, uh, use the example like for uh, example, he's saying do not commit, do not steal, do not do adultery. For that, you uh, get an example from the Bible, or like you have your own example, an allegorized example. Is that fine? Suppose you use an, sorry, an example of what, Sean? Of uh, like, um, let's um, the Exodus. He talks about not commit adultery, do not oh. steal, and all those co ten commandments. But some, but you get an allegorized, um, like a, a point, a point of view, and you say, say during the sermon. Is that? You get an allegorized meaning. Uh, like if you get an example, you say an example. Uh, example is fine. Like suddenly we think suddenly an example comes to your mind. You use it. That's okay. But uh, what, what I'm saying is we shouldn't take the word of God and allegorize it. Like I shouldn't say, uh, you know, some, some story in the Bible and give it a different meaning. Then I'm allegorizing it. That's wrong to do. Cut. Technically, it's wrong. But in some, but in many cases, nobody questions, you know. So it, it kind of people just take it. But I would say avoid doing it. Or if you are doing it, tell the people you're doing it. Like whenever I talk about the Mary miracle, I tell them straight, "Hey, what I'm about to tell you is uh, not the right way to preach. <laughs> uh, but I want you to get the main points." You know, and I tell people, then I share that message. Um, so that means I'm allegorizing. I'm saying something that's not. In the original text, but it's in keeping with the essence of scripture. So it's not violating scripture. So, but avoid doing that too much. Yeah. Can we take a lesson from? Yeah, yeah. So that's illustration. Yeah, you're taking a message, you're taking a meaning out of the passage. That's correct. That's fine. But when we are assigning a meaning to the characters or things in there, that's wrong. Sorry? Yeah, we take the meaning and we apply it to ourselves or apply it to the people. That's fine. That's normal. Yeah, that's fine. So 
uh, the in, in the allegory in the allegory the literal meaning is rendered unimportant so for example you know take the story of um, the uh, the good samaritan the uh, there was this man going from jericho on jericho road you going and he was attacked by thieves he was beaten and wounded and uh, they stole all his things they left him there then the priest came priest didn't help he went away the levite came he didn't help he went away then the samaritan came he saw him then he took care of him and then he you know he bind, put his bandage on the wounds and everything then he took him to the inn uh, what I could say a place of like maybe a hospital or a hotel or whatever he put him there he said take care of him I will pay all the money and so on so Jesus gave that story uh, to illustrate something somebody asked the question who is my brother and then Jesus gave this story to answer the question who is my brother now suppose I take that story and I say, the robbers who came, they are evil spirits. They are attacking people in the world today. And people in the world today are lying, you know, beaten and the devil has stolen, killed from them. And they are lying, hurting and dying on the road. The priest represents somebody who graduated from seminary. He doesn't do anything. The Levite represents somebody who is a who's a priest in the church. He doesn't do anything. The Good Samaritan is the ordinary believer. The you must go and help the people in the world. And the in represents the church. And you must bring those people to the church. And you must pay the money to the church to take care of these people, just as how the goods. What am I doing? I am allegorized because was that the meaning Jesus intended in the story? No. He was just giving a story, answering a question, who is my brother? What was the real meaning? The real meaning was a Samaritan helping a Jew. It means you're going across your cultural, social constraints to care for somebody, to love somebody. That's the person who's your brother, who's a real brother. That's the meaning of the story. He never intended for the inn to represent the church and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, like all that we made up in the story. Okay. He, that was not what he meant. He was giving a story to illustrate answer a question. So the correct way to interpret that story is in its context but the moment i begin to assign this means this this means that that means that then i'm giving something that's allegorizing now you you and i may hear some sermons like that everybody will clap nice sermon but actually it's not the correct way to handle the word of god it's not a good sermon technically it's a bad sermon but general people don't understand. They will clap, say uh, Amen and go. <laughs> they don't understand. But that's actually a wrong, bad sermon because you allegorize, you assign meanings to things that Jesus never intended. Or think, for example, when David went to fight Goliath, he took five stones. First stone represents, represents the word of God. Second stone represents the name of Jesus. Third stone represents Holy Spirit. Fourth stone, the blood of Jesus. Fifth stone, the church. So when you go to face the devil, you have to take these five stones with you. Now some people preach sermons like that. What is it? It's allegorizing. Because that is not in the Bible. That was never intended by the Holy Spirit. It was not intended by the Holy Spirit. But people preach, oh, what revelation? No, I didn't know five stones represented these things. <laughs> what revelation? Fantastic revelation.
five stones. But technically, it's a bad sermon. Because it is not what, you know, what, uh, according to the scripture, Holy Spirit never meant that. But what we have done is, point number three, the allegory is conjuring up hidden ideas for and beyond the text. That means the allegory is making up these ideas. Like when you say five stones, oh, it means these things. It's just made up. Oh, it's you're making up the ideas behind that text and preaching, right? But in the type, when you're looking at a type, in the type, there is clear points of comparison. It's there, it's in the text. And the, the text, the scripture text is highlighting that point. Example, the rock that was struck is Christ. So clear point of comparison. What? The rock was struck, Christ was crucified. Clear points. We are not making it up. The scripture is telling us. Right? Or as Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness, so also Christ, I will be lifted up. Jesus said. So clear point of comparison. You know, the Moses raised up this brass serpent, he put in the middle of the thing, whoever looked on it was saved. So Christ raised up on the cross, whoever looks to him will be saved. Clear point. We're not making it up. Jesus said it. Okay. Number four, there's a fulfillment. So the antitype fulfills it. In the illustration, uh, the truth you know, fulfills it. In the allegory, it does not fulfill anything. It's simply made up. Uh, okay. okay. Five and six. Yeah, so it is designed. It is You find it in scripture. And the allegory is the interpreter's own imagination. He is just imagining something. He is saying something. Right. And the scriptures are designating it as such. So example, another illustration is, you know, God told Jeremiah 18, he says, Jeremiah, go to the potter's house. She goes to the potter's house. He sees the uh, uh, potter working on a vessel. Now God himself is telling Jeremiah, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you, meaning Israel, in my hand. So that is, God himself is telling it. He's not making it up. Yeah, so that means it's a very clear word from God. There is a comparison there as the clay pot. Okay. So some examples here. Um, this is not a full list. Like Melchizedek, Christ, Aaron, Christ, priestly ministry, Passover feast, Christ, our sacrifice, feast of unleavened bread, believers' holy walk. So this is actually mentioned in scripture. So you'll find scripture references here. Right? So in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul is comparing unleavened bread. And he says, just like they made bread without yeast. He says, we also should keep our lives like that. And he's using yeast to represent evil and sin. So he, biblically it's stated. So you can use that. That is correct. Right. So these are examples where it's stated in scripture, so you can preach it, you can teach it, you can explain it, and it'll be very it's correct. Right? Some are similarly some examples of illustrations. Um, Adam and Christ, right? So you find this comparison um, in Romans 5, also in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, through one man, Adam, sin came in. Through one man, Christ, there was grace coming in. Right? Through his disobedience, we were all put under judgment, Adam's disobedience. Through Christ's obedience, we were all made righteous in the eyes of God. So he's comparing. So this we can compare, biblical comparison. But I can't take, exam, example, I can't take Noah. 
and no compare Nova to Jesus. Because it's not a something the Bible assigns. It is true. Noah was a man who walked with God. He was a very righteous man. Uh, God used him to uh, bring uh, the his own family and the animals into the ark. All that is true. We may like to make him compare him to Jesus. We may like to do it. But it's not stated in Scripture. So say, ah, oh, Noah brought everybody into the ark. Rapture. So Jesus will bring all of us in. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't do that. It's not stated. We may feel like doing it. Don't do it. Right? It's not. This is the thing. It ha the question is, is it stated in Scripture? So for something to be a type, something to be an illustration, it has to be stated. Now we can learn lessons. Now, yeah, Noah was a righteous man. He walked with God. He obeyed God. He built an ark. Uh, even when there was no rain, all those lessons we can learn. And Hebrews 11 points to that. He says he was a man of faith, like that. Those are lessons we can learn. But don't make compare him to Jesus. Right? Uh, Jonah and Christ's death, that is in Scripture. Brass serpent raised, that's in Scripture. Right? So these are illustrations that are given to us in Scripture. Yeah, Matthew 24, you know, Jesus compares uh, Jonah and his coming. Okay. So you've understood so far uh, types and shadows. I've made it very simple, but you understood this? Questions? Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. Preached, yes. Yeah. Okay, so good question. <laughs> so the question is. Uh, what, what Prince asked is, um, in Philippians 1, Paul says that some preach Christ out of envy and out of jealousy. But Paul is saying, hey, as long as Jesus is being preached, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not buried. Um, so the question is, is it okay if people are actually allegorizing scripture texts? And uh, uh, is it okay? And people are being blessed. Uh, is it okay or should we go and correct them? I think it depends on the relationship you have with that person. For example, if any one of our pastors stand up and preach like that, I'll call them. <laughs> I'll say, hey, don't do this again. Because I have a relationship with them, I can correct them. right? And, and I correct them. Now, even, uh, even if it's not, even for other things, like if, even how they communicate and all that. I give them feedback. And I'm not doing it to put them down. I'm doing it to make them better. right? But I have that relationship with all our pastors. So they know that when I correct them, I'm not doing it to hurt them. I'm doing it to make them better. So that kind of relationship I have. But I will never do that with some pastor somewhere there. Because I don't have that relationship. I can't speak like that to that person. And so I won't do it. You know, I, I'll just leave it. So to answer your question, it really depends on the relationship you have with that person, whether you can go and give them feedback. But the fact is, uh, there are lots of preachers and lots of sermons like that today. Right? People are just, they'll take anything, say anything, and you're listening to it, and you say, like, I know this is, technically, you must not be doing this. But, you know, everybody's happy, everybody's clapping, people are being blessed. So you can't do anything about it because, you know, you don't have a relationship with that preacher to go and tell him or her that uh, this is not the way to handle the word or interpret the word. Uh, yeah, so lots of strange sermons. The sad part is when certain ideas actually put people into bondage. You see, there are some 
sermons people preach, people feel very free, happy, and all okay. But there are certain sermons where they come out of misinterpreting scripture that actually puts people into bondage. It puts them into you know certain forms of legalism and all those things. And that's very sad, you know, because that congregation or those people who are listening to that message feel they have to do follow certain things and it brings them in bondage. So that's a difficult thing. But only if you have a relationship with that person that you can go and correct them. Otherwise, it's difficult. They won't even receive, you know, they'll slap you back. So, all right, any questions from, uh, uh, from the online class? Any questions on types and shadows? I uh, hope, hope it was clear and how to use types, illustrations, and avoid allegorizing. Right, so I hope that was clear. Any questions? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we have two questions here. Let's take it. Yeah. After you. Yeah. How to study the Bible? No. Ah. See, if we use, uh, I, I guess that there's nothing wrong in using stories and illustrations from everyday life. There's nothing wrong. Ex and next chapter, next lesson we're going to learn is about parables. Right. So what are parables? Parables are stories from everyday life. So even Jesus took, you know, things from everyday life, farmer, fishing, this, that. He used those stories to talk to his audience. Right. So to answer your question, uh, there is nothing wrong if we use stories from our world today to explain to people, help them understand. There's nothing wrong with it. So it's fine. Only thing is make sure the story uh, brings the message across correctly and it's a clean story like i don't know about movies and all but <laughs> uh, but generally you know keep a use a clean story uh, to communicate spiritual story, that's fine you just use story so example if i might say i might use some experience in life to talk about this is how god works no, it's okay but ultimately for for me most important is people must be established in the word of god they cannot see the problem is people remember the story, they don't remember the word of God. That's the problem. So if we ask them, what did Pastor preach today? They'll tell the story. They won't tell what was the Bible, what did the Bible say? They won't remember. So that's the sad part, you know. So personally for me. I, uh, I I avoid using too many stories, um, even my own personal testimonies. I avoid doing it in in certain contexts. I might share, but I want people to understand the scriptures. I want them to know chapter and verse. I want them to know this is what the Bible says. Otherwise, they will remember the story. They may even remember some catchy phrase I used, you know. But you can't fight the devil with a catchy phrase. You can't fight the devil with the story. You have to fight the devil with the word of God. Right? So what's the point? Yeah, so, so I like to establish people in God's word. So, so I think there's a there's a balance in doing things. But the, to answer the question, there's nothing wrong in using a story. Sean. Uh, so what I wanted to ask is like uh, similar to Wimmel's connecting to Wimmel's thing, like um for example, can I like uh, like is it okay to take like certain examples like uh, from a series that I used to that I watch? Is that they showed a scene where um, a lady that goes to church every day, you know, um, she's she's very involved in the church. She's a good a good person. She handles uh, almost everything uh, church wise, and she's very has a good relationship with the pastor. So the thing is that this lady's son, unfortunately, had a child outside marriage with another woman. 
But later, the next day when she went to church, um, since it's a small town, everyone knew about what happened. And they started to think bad about the uh, lady, about she didn't raise the child right and all that. But, um, you know, uh, the attitude completely changed towards her in the church when she entered the church. And something like uh, like holding hands during prayer, they wouldn't even ha hold her because they think that she's impure, you know, unholy, because look what a child has done. So like that, I mean, like... Um, what I want to say is that uh, just, just because like her, her child did that, they immediately like put. I mean, they put blame on her, and they immediately keep her out of all things. Mm. They, you know, uh, out, out of out of the church, they're not involving anything else. In fact, mm. even the pastor, whom she handles accounts and everything, all the church duties, like revealed her out of her duty, mm. because uh, you know this happened, so and so happened, and uh, he's trying to keep face. Because uh, all the uh, believers of his, uh, all the members of his church are saying, "Look what this lady has done." So he doesn't want her to work in her in the church anymore. So, uh, you know, if it's a true story, or whatever, like there's no harm in sharing the story yeah. and using that as an illustration of what we should not do. Now, this is like, like this story is like shown a series. It's not a true story. Like sorry, that. this sto story was shown a series, like um, a, a season episode, like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, anyway, I mean, you can just give an, I mean, you don't have to tell them, okay, I saw this in this series or whatever. You just say, okay, see, this happens in real life. Or example, think for example, there was a woman like this and this happened, this happened. You can use that. And then you can use that to illustrate, like, this is what we should not do, right? Uh, we can't put the blame on the this woman. We should still love them. We must welcome them. They need to be part of the community and so on. So you can use, I mean, this, so the answer is, it's perfectly fine to use illustrations, stories, uh, from real life or you know whatever that co they communicate a point, right? And then you back it up in scripture. Like for example, we can say this: you know, the Bible tells us to love even as Christ loved us, right? Ephesians five. So, uh, would Christ love this woman? Of course, he, he would love this woman in spite of what has happened in her life. Uh, would he love her? Yes. Would he welcome her? Yes. And so we also, as God's people, must you know be loving and so on. So I think you can use a story. Nothing wrong with the story. Uh, and bring the scripture in to establish people in the word of God. That's fine. So then, okay, fine. So let's pause here. Next, the next lessons that are coming up. One is on parables, how to interpret parables. Then we're going to talk about avoid, avoiding allegorizing. We'll get into a little bit more detail on that. Then we'll talk about prophetic scripture, how to interpret prophetic scripture. So piece by piece. Okay. So we're doing all this separately, but really all this must come together. Right? When you are studying the Word of God, you must study about all these. You must keep all these things in mind. Grammar, figure of speech, types and shadows, and put it all together. Right? Uh, before that, last week we talked about being cultural, what's permanent, what's temporary, and so on. Okay, let's close. Let's close in prayer, and uh, we'll continue this. So I think next week, uh, because of exams, there may not be class. Uh, let's see. I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. And I'll, let, I'll keep you informed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, the discussions. Thank you for the learning. And uh, we pray that each one of us, God, will learn how to handle your word correctly and be a blessing to people and to strengthen people in you and in your word, in your truth. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you everyone.